Uh, thank you very much, Bob. I am definitely excited to be here. Before I start the presentation, just to give you a real quick background, my name is Gary Picodner. I am the program manager for the weather technology in the cockpit program. We are a research program, um, and a lot of the modernization I'm going to talk to a little bit later. Unfortunately, it's really hard to demo here. If you come over to the FAA Safety Center afterwards or anytime today and tomorrow, I have the virtual reality goggles. You can see how to use those. And I can tell you, having sat here for a week, if you think you are going to use, not use technology like this for your young learners, I'm not going to say for the older ones, you're kidding yourself. It is unbelievable how engaging and how comfortable, and that's the way they just seem to learn. And I'm talking from four years old to about 20. We have just had people spend hours sitting there learning weather without even realizing they're learning. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, my background is I am an electrical engineer. I am not a pilot. I am also not a meteorologist. But the nature of the weather technology in the cockpit program is taking meteorological stuff and our goal is to actually solve problems, and that's why it's an engineering issue. Terry, who'll introduce himself, he has a very different background, and I think you'll like, we're gonna be doing a tag team. His information and mine are gonna be very different, um, so if I bore you to death, when Terry comes up, he'll probably fascinate you, or vice versa. You may find his drier, and you may find my stuff fascinating if you like sort of seeing where things are going. So hopefully between the two of us, we will keep you entertained. So the first thing, and I always do this, I don't know if anybody has heard me speak before, but I always start with this. Part of our research is always to identify what the problems are. Like I said, our goal is to fix problems, and you got to know clearly what they are. And that's part of the reason I love being out at AirVenture. I totally welcome whether it's here in the tent or over at the safety center. If you have any issues with weather, we have meteorologists over there from the FAA, we have myself, we have a human factors person. Any sort of issues you're having, we wanna hear it. And don't kid yourself, if we don't get this feedback, we're, we're operating in a vacuum. We don't know where to put all our research, where your problems are, and we just don't get to get out that much. These fly-ins are a really great opportunity for us to talk to pilots that fly from all, not only all over the NAS, but all over the world. So really feel free, be constructive, don't throw any tomatoes at me or anything like that, but if you're constructive, I have definitely can tell you factually, no lie, a lot of research we do has stemmed from people coming to us and identifying issues. So please feel free to stop by. If it's more meteorological, I'd rather you come by our uh, center and talk to our meteorologist, but I'll do my best to understand. So the reason I start with the gaps, let's see, can I get this to move? It's the one, that, the, it's the arrow that's faded. It's... Yeah, that's what I'm pushing, yeah, there we go. I always do this first, and then I'll hand off to Terry, is why are you here as instructors? And the big thing I want to stress is we continue to run a variety of analyses and tests and various ways to assess pilot knowledge. And if you look at this, it's just to show it, scores are low, and I always emphasize this. This test was designed by aviation meteorologists. The questions were designed around aviation, things that apply to aviation. And so we looked at this, and you can see student pilots were down in 49%. They fail miserably. Up to even instrument-rated pilots were only at 65% over general scores. So we started saying, you know, and we recognized this as we looked. The training materials for the flight instructors may not be sufficient. You know, everybody who's a flight instructor is not a meteorologist. And we started looking, do, are we giving you guys enough good curriculum? Are we producing the products you need that help you teach weather? And that's why I said we've been looking more and more at modernizing it, and you'll see some of that later on. So this isn't a bad instructor. We're not viewing you guys as being deficient, and that's why I want to hear issues. Our view is you don't have the right materials out there to do a good job, and we're trying to enhance that. And the more I hear back from you, we can continue to improve those products so you can do a better job of getting your flight students trained in weather. This is just a quick breakdown also that kind of shows you something else. As you can see, four of those scores are down in the 50s, but then when you look at like upper level charts and surface charts, you're starting to get passing grades. So you can see it's also, 
And that's where the meteorologists at the FAA and our research have come in. Obviously, the ease of using the products is also different. So we continue to look at that as well. Are the products intuitive enough? Do they have the glance values? So we're working those issues. And again, as flight instructors, if you tell us what things are difficult, what your students get confused about, we'll try to do research to make those areas easier. This is um, what I showed you were some old scores. We recently re-ran this exam at an MMOPA. They actually asked us to do this. They wanted their membership to kind of see where their weather knowledge is. And what was interesting on this is MMOPA is a high, you know, they're a pretty highly instrumented aircraft and most of their pilots were IFR rated, instrument rated. And you can see the scores are comparable. They're they, they have low scores in different areas, but overall they didn't really do any better than the generic we used AOPA to get us a broad type of pilot. Most were VFR in that original study, which are the scores on the right. But you can see even the instrumented pilots, you know, station plots, they're down at 50%. METARs, which you would think would be pretty good, what is that, like 69? So you see a lot of Ds, Fs, TAFs, 52% for an instrument rated pilot. So we're still seeing a lot of issues. Another study, and which we've done twice now, this is a scenario based, and I, we really recommend this is for flight instructors to use a lot of the scenarios. And we had a talk earlier in the week um, done by Danny Sims, one of our meteorologists, that the scenarios really help you apply weather. And that's what this study is. So you can see this is a common scenario of lowering ceilings. And the purpose of this is to not even, not just show that your students understand the weather. As you guys probably recognize as you're teaching, there's, you have to be able to take that weather information and spatially recognize the cloud heights and the visibility and coordinate it with where you're going to be. It's great to know there's going to be a storm over LA, but that's useless if you're not flying over LA. If you're flying over LA, you got to know if the storm and your time in that area overlap. So, and that's where we're seeing some of the troubles. So that's one of the things we continue to look at. And we actually have some tools. If you come over, we have a tool called Flight Profiler that's gonna try to help address this issue and we're gonna run some benefits analysis on it. If you look at the scores here on this, you can see out of 84 pilots, not a single pilot, as I recall, estimated their ceiling correctly. After doing a pre-beef with the information and laying out their flight and trying to coordinate or show that they had a good mental model of where the bad weather was compared to their flight time, not one person got them all correct. And then even on visibility. And you can see, what we see as a consistent thing is you start getting out to regions three, four, and five, away from your takeoff is where the issues really start to occur. So. They seem to focus more on the takeoff, and these are some of the things. They have a hard time depicting it along the route. They hold incorrect west weather expectations in route and at the destination. And most of the time, and we even saw this in live data from the um, NASA data, where they keep the ASRIS data, the Aviation Safety Reporting System, sort of matched our data as well. So they're, having, they're expecting VFR conditions at their destination, and they're not. And some of the things we took from this is, hey, they may not be using forecast products enough. They're relying too much on observations, which are obviously easier to understand. And then it's providing this holistic, a full mental model. Are they doing that? So now I'm going to hand it off to Terry. I've given you a few reasons why you should want to pay attention to Terry. And he's going to give you a little more on the actual teaching of weather. And then I'm going to talk about some modernized products. So here's Terry. There you go. Thank you, Gary. Uh, my name is uh, Terry Lankford. I started flying seriously in 1966 in a U.S. Air Force Aero Club in uh, England. I got my private pilot certificate. Yes, certificate, the FAA can't spell license. In England in 1966. And from there on the GI Bill, I obtained my uh, commercial instrument flight instructor, which made me eligible uh, for a position as an air traffic control specialist with the FAA, and I got into flight service, and I worked uh, for, in flight service uh, at a flight service station for 25 years with the FAA, and I retired in 1998. And uh, since you folks are continuing to pay me, which I really appreciate, I decided I would continue to work with the FAA's aviation safety program. Now, uh, the video goes by the podium. Uh oh. Okay, so now, any, 
Anybody here from the National Weather Service? Okay, we can make fun of them. Everybody, as everybody knows, aviation forecasts are 100% correct. 90% in the summer and 10% in the winter. <laughs> now, uh, let's see if we can move right along here. What button did you just push on the black screen? Oh. So it's just this top one. Little recurrent training. That's a laser. Got it. <laughs> okay. Reality check. I love this. Every theory of the course of events in nature is necessarily based on some simplification of the process and is to some extent, therefore, a fairy tale. Well, Sir William Napier Shaw's observation some 100 years ago is still uh, effective today. Even though we've had a tremendous increase in observations, uh, automated weather observations, satellite and radar, and with computers, we have much better computer models, but they're still only generating approximations, so we still have uh, probabilities. I'm going to have to move along because what I wanted to talk with you about today is one of the newer aviation forecast products. Graphical forecast for aviation. Those of you that have been around as long as I know, I, I have, know that the uh, old text area forecast left a lot to be desired, especially forecast for tops. And the problem with uh, uh, text forecast is it's very difficult to try to put in a written narrative format, something that will cover eight to 12 hours. The National Weather Service, along with the FAA, have developed graphical forecasts for aviation. And these came online. Actually, the uh, text AirMet products, the uh, graphical uh, AirMet products, came on in 2007. And then in 2017, we started to get the graphical forecast for aviation. And so what I'd like to do is just give you a little example of how we can teach learners how to use this en route product. And as Gary mentioned, one of the biggest problems we have today is that pilots fail to consider the en route phase of flight as far as what is actually going to occur along the route. There we go. Here we have an example. This is Calaveras, California. Uh, actually, my home base. It's out in the Sierra Nevada foothills behind the first range of, uh, uh, of Sierra foothills and uh, just east of uh, the Bay Area in Central California. The Aviation Surface and Cloud Forecast Graphics, these products are available from the National Weather Service Aviation Weather Center's webpage, and these are also the products that you will see when you get a web briefing from uh, Lidos uh, Flight Service. Now, they're valid at three hour intervals, which means that we can, and we've got to be careful because these are point forecasts, they are not averages. So we have to be careful about interpreting because things will change at either a regular or irregular rate during the forecast period. In the first example, we have Calaveras, and the surface winds and are with the wind barbs indicate that the wind is from the southeast at approximately uh, 20, and then the red uh, wind barbs indicate gusts out of the southeast, approximately 160 degrees of 20 gusting to 30 knots. Visibility, and by the way, these are point forecasts. The visibility is an overlay, and the visibility in this particular case is in the blue area, which indicates between three and five miles. Where between three and five? We don't know. So we have to, operationally, we have to round down to three miles. So we've got a visibility of three miles. Weather forecast, generally rain showers. Some snow showers up over the uh, higher uh, foothills, so we're going to actually uh, disregard those because these are at a higher elevation and we know the temperature at Calaveras is above freezing. So we're going to go with rain showers. 
Sealing. This gets really tricky, especially on this particular forecast product, because we don't have an actual forecast of a ceiling at Calaveras. What we have is point forecast surrounding Calaveras. So operationally, what we're going to do is take the lowest point forecast, which happens to be overcast, bases at 1,700 feet. Now, these happen to be MSL bases. Now, that means we have to take the elevation at Calaveras, which is 1,300 feet, subtract 1,700, we get an overcast layer at 400 feet. So converting this graphical product into something that, well, actually, I did it in a TAF format, we end up with a visibility of three miles with a ceiling of 400 overcast. This is probably unrealistic. It probably indicates multiple cloud layers at that particular point, but still we must consider it when we're doing our flight planning. And then we can go ahead and do the same thing for the uh, 18Z forecast and then the 21Z forecast. Now, let's assume that our estimated time of arrival is between 15 and 17, or 15 and 1800 Zulu. Because we don't know when these are going to change, we're going to have to use the lowest values. So for a 1700 arrival, we're going to have to use four miles visibility and one, or, uh, correction, a ceiling of 400 overcast with a visibility of one statute mile. Now these may not be the same. We'll show you how we can actually uh, get around this a little bit. So this is the aviation surface and cloud forecast product. Now, if we want to get a second opinion, we can go to the National Weather Service Aviation Weather Center site and how we have the graphical forecast for aviation and the advantages right off the bat are we have forecast valid at one hour intervals as opposed to three hours. We also have overlays which are going to give us some specific values for Calaveras. So, we take 1700Z, here's Calaveras, we see that the winds are in the dark blue. So if we go down to the legend, the dark blue is between 20 and 25 knots. What we're going to do is round up to 25 knots, we're going to take the worst value or the most hazardous value. So we're going to come up with a wind direction, generally southeasterly, 150 at 25 knots, and then by checking the uh, uh, red wind barbs, we can see the gusts are at 30 knots, so that's a pretty much exactly the same as we got off of the uh, surface clouds and forecast. Now, we can go over to the visibility, and the visibility is the same, indicated here by the uh, dark blue, visibility between three and four miles, so we'll round down to three miles. Weather, uh, we have to know what the uh, different symbols are, and isn't it interesting how in aviation, if you wait just a little while, things go right back to the way they were before. I started out in aviation in 1966, and we had slow flight. Then when I became an instructor, we had minimum controllable airspeed. Then we went back to slow flight. Then we went back to minimum controllable airspeed. What are we at now? Slow flight, I think, again. So if we wait a little while, things will go back the way they were. In any case, the really isn't a problem because each page in the graphical forecast for aviation has a symbols menu where you can actually click on it and get the symbols for the product. So that's really relatively easy to get. So we have rain, light rain, and at uh, over here for the ceiling, we see it's dark blue. The dark blue is 1,000 to 2,000 feet, so we're going to round down to 1,000 feet. So it's 1,700Z, we've got a visibility of three miles, light rain, with a ceiling of 1,000 overcast. This is probably much more realistic for Calaveras. Now, the advantages of a terminal aerodrome forecast is that we have human intervention. We have an actual forecaster that's going to massage these things, and the forecaster is going to take the data from these uh, graphical products, which are actually the computer models, and then look and use their professional training and experience to put the thing, uh, massage the forecast into the best thing that they think it will probably be, and they will also monitor it because these there's no uh, forecast amendments to any of these products. However, they are updated every hour. So we have the forecast for Calaveras, and let's see how we can let's see if we can interpret this a little bit here. Oh, I, 
one more thing, a cloud tops point forecast overlay. Again, I mentioned that the, one of the biggest problems we've had, especially with the text area forecast, is tops. Now, out in California, the real big problem, especially for those of us that didn't have sophisticated aircraft, you know, we're talking about our Turbo 150s and Piper Warriors, is what are the cloud tops of the Stratus? And we get this along the coast in the uh, uh, late spring and summer, and then we get the Thule fog, the, the fog layers in the Central Valley in the wintertime. And this is a particular wintertime situation out in the Central Valley. Well, it's really important to have tops. We can look at the grid forecasts, and the grid forecasts show us uh, tops between about 1,200 and 1,800 feet. But we don't know what it would be like in between. We can go to the overlay, and the overlay is the blue, and we see that the overlay for the dark blue indicates tops between the surface and 3,000 feet. Well, by putting these two together, we can assume that the tops are going to be generally around 1,500 to 2,000 feet. Now, that's a really good product, and we know we have a stable situation so if we know the synopsis, we can uh, deduce from that that in the Central Valley are solid cloud tops throughout the valley with tops roughly between 1,500 and 2,000 feet. Really good product. We can also get the tops along the coast. And this provides us with specific tops for the entire country. So this is a really great product and a real advantage over the text area forecast. Uh. I want to get to the end here, which we've got some uh, advice. Operational considerations. When we're talking with learners, we want to make sure that we talk to them, make sure that they, they get a standard briefing or a complete briefing prior to departure. You can get updates anywhere from uh, five to seven days ahead of time but get a standard or a complete weather briefing as close to departure time as possible. Update weather en route. This is probably one of the biggest uh, failings that I've seen on NTSB accident reports. Pilots fail to update weather en route and keep an eye on the weather. Where is the weather good? Where is it not so good? And what would we do if we need an alternate? When I was briefing, we had one of our uh, local uh, pilots, uh, a charter pilot, well, it was a, a, a Part 135 operation. They did the cargo hauling. And this pilot would call in every morning for a standard briefing, and if there was any weather, the next thing he would ask for is, where's the nearest VFR? And I thought, boy, that guy's really gotten the ball. So he knew if he had a problem, where the best weather would be. Check METARs for destination and alternates. Check TAFs, especially at TAF update times. Okay, TAFs are updated uh, at uh, six hour intervals, 0Z, uh, excuse me, 02Z, 08Z, and, and so on. But it's a good idea to update weather. Monitor fuel reserves. Make sure you have enough, if you don't have enough fuel, then you need to go to an alternate. I can give you a case study on that. This might be something of a scenario-based training. We were flying the Turbo 150 from uh, Phoenix to Albuquerque. And with the one fuel on the 150, we needed a 10-knot tailwind for me to keep my standard one-hour fuel reserve. Now, if we didn't get the 10 knots, I had to divert to Gallup. And I actually had it plotted out on my chart. If I reached a certain point, if I was not on time at that particular point, we would divert to Gallup for fuel. So they just think the planning ahead and being ready in case something happens that we are ready to divert. Land short or divert. Should conditions approach or deteriorate below regulatory or realistic personal minimums? We've got personal minimums, right? All of us? I hope so. If we're instructors, we are assigning our learners personal minimums. Should conditions approach or deteriorate below regulatory or realistic personal minimums, including surface winds, we need to divert or come up with a plan B. And I know uh, myself, I would always rather land early and then check the weather and then make another, uh, another leg out of it, rather than get into deteriorating conditions, especially if you have a problem with fuel reserves. Now, with that, we're going to go back to Gary.
So hearing Terry's spe speech, he reminded me of one thing, and he may know the name. Um, one tip I want to give you that we've really been starting to push, and I, I don't know if this is the exact formal name, and Terry may know, but I think you really want to turn your students on. I also want to see how many instructors, and I'm going to call it the forecast discussion page on aviationweather.gov. Is that the right name? Do you know, Terry? Area forecast discussion. How many flight instructors here go to that page and use it? Do you teach your students to go there? Great. For those who didn't raise their hand, talk to the guys who do. Especially, you know, as you go a few days out, that page is full of information. It doesn't give you those abbreviated things. It's in English. There's a lot of technical jargon you can weed through, but you can really get clues even a few days out so you don't get set with get homeitis or planning your trip. They really give you a good feel whether or not you're going to have inclement weather, what conditions there are, where they expect icing. So if that's a product you're not familiar with, we've really started to try to encourage pilots, and I really would love to see flight instructors that are using that start referring your students to it. It's a great resource, especially a couple days out. So one of the things I wanted to talk about that we're starting, this is part of our research, and I'm kind of giving you a little heads up that we've seen areas, again, of gaps that um, as you're teaching, not, and we know you're not going to go into depth on some of this, and some of this is research, and it's very consistent with what Thierry said, but it's taking it to some different levels. So one of the things, when I talk representativeness, there are areas, especially in GA, and this came out of some helicopter research, obviously where you lack density of weather information. And what we're trying to look at is how can you best assess what one area is if there's no ASOS or, a weather, or other weather station there, if, and how do you know which system or ASOS to use as being most representative of your area of flight? And a couple things you need to point out to your students is in some areas, if there's altitude, the ASOS has an altitude bias, and Terry kind of pointed to that a little. There's data density issues. You have the mesonet out there, which may not be official weather, but there is value to using that if you use it correctly. And we're trying to find ways to bring that in in a manner that it can add confidence or highlight risks but not necessarily be used in the same way that you would use an ASOS reading. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about terrain. I'm not going to cover winds at all in this. Uh, a little bit on the humidity. Um, so when I'm talking again on representativeness, and this I think is a great chart to use for students because we've seen some accident reports where it comes in. This is taken over at the Georgia-South Carolina border. And you see the dots are your typical VFR, IVFR or MVFR, IFR, and low IFR. And then you see, obviously, there's some black dots that aren't filled in. So then the question comes in, what do you tell your students to use if they're flying to areas that don't have that, those dots? So what we've been finding is a lot of pilots, just for simplicity, will say, hey, it's the nearest neighbor. And we're trying to tell people that can get you into trouble. And this has come out of a variety of accidents investigations. So let me click a little closer. And you can see, I don't know if that's what you expected to see on the colors. Now you go even a little closer. Notice the nearest neighbor is not a good representation. And sometimes what's nearby or seemingly close can be radically different. That is something to really caution new flyers. There are a lot of people think weather is so predictable. You know, when you watch the Weather Channel, I think, oh, you just see these big fronts moving across. And you assume anything close by is it. So somebody who really hasn't taken the training, you want to emphasize to them, you got to actually do some research on where you're going and make sure you have an accurate source of information. And I think this really depicts it. So I recommend trying to use something like this to show that don't just assume that because something is the closest, that's your best weather information. Another thing along these lines, and I'm going to admit, I'm going to go through this high level for teaching. I am, again, I will emphasize, I'm not the meteorologist. And Terry may even comment on this if he hasn't seen this on his thoughts. But what I'm showing here is there's an altitude bias a lot of times. A lot of the ASOS in the hilly areas are down in the valley. And that can be a little misleading. So if you look at the upper right, in that case, the ASOS is in the clouds, so you're going to get its IFR conditions. In the next one, you can see the mesonet starts to be in there, so it's going to have a high relative humidity. And the ASOS is also still in the clouds. But as you notice, as the cloud deck rises, What's happening? That humidity is starting to clear out where the ASOS is. So it can be telling you, hey, it's VFR conditions, but what's the altitude where the cloud is? 
that's in terrain where you're actually going to be flying. So you got to, again, know where the ASOS station, and make sure your students understand that, that the ASOS does a certain function, and that it isn't a tell-all. And I know some pilots will talk about it's as, uh, there's a hole to heaven when it points up sometimes, because it is a very short laser in a limited area. And you have to make sure your students understand that. Don't just because it's automation, read those numbers. And you can see on the last one, as it even rises, you know that situation is going to even extend more, that you can end up in a cloud deck, and you're going to have an ASOS saying it's clear because it's down in the valley. Another one just wanted to really talk, touch on real quickly here is, and I know I've even heard Terry talk about this, is the idea that dew point converge, dew point depression, if you get zero, you're always going to have fog. And that's a little bit misleading as well. We've done some research on this, and you can see occasionally, and it depends on high resolution and low resolution, but depending what data you're using, you can see in the top condition, their dew point depression is zero. And the no fog versus the time there's fog or mist is 330 to 27. So 92% of the time, you're having a false alarm. So you've got to look again. Don't take these rules too blindly. Make sure you understand the meteorology and weather behind them. And make sure you're emphasizing that to your students. There's hard rules. And I know Terry has a line like that as well, because I've heard him brief. Hard rules are rules, not hard rules. Very few things are absolute, so be careful as you use some things that people like to say for, to simplify. If you oversimplify, you can get into trouble. So I also want to talk, this is a little bit about the modernization of teaching. And like I said, we have a lot of these tools over. I brought them here. You can demo them. You can see they're coming. Some are available to transition to you as flight instructors. And like I told you, a big thing what we're trying to do is bring more augmented reality where you get videos and things like that on the page and it's not pure text. And then obviously virtual reality where it's 3D and you can experience it. And that has a couple advantages, obviously, is for young learners, it's how people think now when they're younger. That's the tech, they've grown up with technology. Text is boring. It's not engaging. It also gives more experiential. It brings more elements in than just text where you're getting the knowledge. So hopefully, you'll try to incorporate these tools and start looking for them. So some of the things that are benefits, like I said, there's immersion, there are animations. Those things help, especially certain learners that maybe have some learning disabilities. Interactive, they're interactive, which helps you test your skills. And it's real world. They put context to it. It's not just on a page. So this gives you an example of just some of the tools. And you can see, you know, when these things come to life and you would see it at our place, you actually can watch the thunderstorm grow, decay, the impacts. You can ask them to predict where the wind vectors are going to go. And you'll actually see the wind vectors move as they go from the formation stage to an impact stage. And you can ask your students to predict those things. And when they see it in action, you'll find it's much easier to learn than just looking at a bunch of pictures. So we have models for these kinds of things. And I'm not going to run through this. Same thing with microbursts. Um, we had some kids over there looking at this stuff, and they learned this stuff. I, I had a six-year-old who was watching this and knew what he was saying because it's engaging. They thought it was a game, and they learned where the arrows go. They took it at a different level, but they still learned it. And you can see here the effects of the microburst. The yellow is how much it diverts your aircraft. Like I said, a six-year-old can follow that. He sees where you're supposed to go as the magenta, and you can see the impact, and it registers. It's a lot different than looking at text. So immediate next steps, we're trying to build more of these. We're going to try to put some of this information out. A lot of them are not going to be finished products, but hopefully the flight instructors can start incorporating these tools into your lesson plan and that we can help and you build more to it. Now, I'm going to hand this back to Terry. I just want to do a little introduction. This is kind of the closing. The FAA came out recently with a new standard, and since Terry is a flight instructor, he actually has used it, unlike myself who knows it exists. But what this was is, as most of you know, Self-briefing has become the norm. It's fast, it's easy, but as you saw at the beginning with the weather knowledge, just because it's fast and easy doesn't mean everybody, when they do, it's getting the information they want. And I always tell people, when I was a kid, they used to have full-service gas. Now they have self-service. Everybody loves it. It's fast. Full service for those who weren't old enough, they actually used to check your oil, they'd wash your windows. When you got gas, your car got serviced. It wasn't just you got fuel. So though they're convenient, they weren't equivalent. And sometimes the, so you gotta be careful that self-briefings may not be. 
The FAA is trying to clarify. We know there's some confusion. There are things like people will talk a legal briefing. There's no such thing. There's a certified briefing. No such, not a thing. You got to make sure that your students understand what terms are real, what things are out there that people are using terminology. Obviously, some pre-briefs get logged, which is a good thing. Some systems don't log it. Obviously, it's a big advantage that people know, in case you do get an accident, what you looked at for your weather briefing. So we'd love it if it does get logged. And OK, this, um, I'm going to hand off to Terry from here. I think I just did the intro. I, he, he is, he, I've heard him brief this to me, and he does a great job on this. And I really hope you guys will incorporate the standards, and he's going to sell you on this. It's a really good standard, and I think he can tell you from experience. Okay, thank you, uh, Gary. A couple of uh, notes that uh, uh, Gary brought up. Weather is complex and dynamic. There are few, if any, never or always when it comes to the weather. Watch out for absolutes. Watch out for oversimplifications and generalizations. One of the uh, perfect examples of that is with a temp close temperature dew point spread approximately 3 degrees Celsius, expect fog. Close temperature dew point spread is only one factor in the formation of fog. There are many other factors involved. If you're interested on getting some specific information on how fog forms, the Aviation Weather Center's YouTube channel has a presentation on IFR conditions. You can go, go and click on that and view that. Also, there is a website if you Google bad clouds, bad clouds, and what you will get is a presentation by a meteorology professor at the, I believe it's the University of Pennsylvania, which talks about some of these over uh, generalizations and oversimplifications. So those are a couple of sources for you. One other thing, and for the National Weather Service, the examples that I showed you of the graphical forecast for aviation, they're changing the format just slightly, and uh, it will become online probably early next year, and the uh, uh, main idea behind it is that it will be usable on iPads and tele on phones and, and uh, smartphones. So they're a much better presentation on those devices. So you might want to take a look at that. And if you have any comments, uh, they would be happy to uh, uh, get those from you. Now, let's see where we are here. Okay, the, the, the different uh, types of things, as Gary mentioned, uh, I don't particularly like the uh, term, there is no such thing as a legal briefing. Be careful when you use other than FAA or other sources that don't provide a, all the information that the FAA considers a standard briefing. Then it's kind of up to you to get all that information. If you have any questions, contact the flight service station and they'll be able to assist you with that. <coughs> AC 9192. Let's see if we've got it here. AC 9192 is an advisory circular that the FAA has recently put out and it talks about different types of briefings uh, what you might want to think about as far as getting these type of briefings, and it's an excellent uh, publication. You can go ahead and download that from the FAA's uh, website, and it will be a good a general product to get some general information on the types of briefings and what information is available. The FAA has also developed a WINGS program on self-briefing. I know I took it myself. It's one of the better uh, programs. I would suggest it for any individual, including already uh, certificated pilots and flight instructors, to take that course and see what's available. It's an excellent course. There's also, they have the uh, wing student worksheets available and uh, additional documentation for flight instructors. And they're working on, and I think we have it here as well, See if we can cut it. They're working on a program, a program that will for IFR pilots. It should be out within about another six months. 
So keep, uh, and you can get that, you can see, check its status by, uh, if, uh, as instructors, I assume you're all probably on FAAsafety.gov. A lot of good, valuable information there. Now, I'd like to thank Gary for allowing me to participate with him and the National Association of Flight Instructors, our AV guy. And but most of all, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to participate in the FAA's Aviation Safety Program. And